Two weeks ago in this exact same spot stood a 30 foot tall jacaranda tree. Now that jacaranda tree gave us plenty of shade so we could hang out all summer long, but also entirely shaded out the garden right over there while also sucking up a lot of the water from those plants. So ultimately over time, we had an arborist come check it out. Turns out it was full of termites and it was dead and dying and on the way out. It was posing a huge risk towards the house. So we decided that it was time to just remove it and grind the stump out entirely. But not everything is lost because in its place is going to be a wonderful rebirthed garden and that is a native plant garden. Now native plant gardens are really wonderful for a lot of different reasons. They look great, they're very low maintenance, but most importantly to me is that they will attract and harbor all of those beneficial native insect populations that you want in your yard and garden. The nice thing about a native plant garden is that once you kind of set it up, it's a perennial zone where you don't really want to mess around with it too much. It doesn't require much fertility. It doesn't require much watering. So it's really quite a wonderful thing to have. But before we do that, we have to do a little bit of work on the soil here because it was just not too long ago, a stump that was totally ground into the dirt. And also we need to talk about placement, different heights and growing conditions that these plants need. So let's start off by moving all these plants out of the way and talking about the soil in its place. Before we start sifting, and don't worry, I'll talk about that weird looking contraption in a moment here. We're actually going to move as much of this material to one side as we can. So that way we have a kind of clean soil area with a woody soil area that we could separate from. So I'm gonna just start by raking as much as I can from that side over to this side. Now we have enough material to actually start sifting it. And what I have over here is a sieve that I've built to normally sit on top of my wheelbarrow. I use it all the time to sift my compost out. But what I've done is I've added a leg on each side and a crossbar for support to keep it at an angle. The idea behind this is that I want it to be solid as I do something like this. And the other idea behind it is that I want as much of the actual small material to fall through and all the larger material, which is hopefully mostly wood, to kind of come out to the bottom. So I'm gonna give it a shake. And then everything that's at the bottom here is actually mostly wood chips. So I'm gonna leave it into this bucket and I'm gonna take this bucket out, probably just throw it in my compost at the end. But for now, let's go ahead and sift this all out. So that actually worked pretty well for that top layer, but as I'm digging into this, I'm realizing this is literally entirely wood chips or essentially like 60% wood chips, 40% soil. So I think in hindsight, I'm going to actually just shovel off the top, maybe six inches of this entire bed and just replace it with topsoil. So let's see what that looks like next. Wanted to bring you up close to show you exactly what happened so far. So over here, this is the material that was sifted. You can see there's a lot of big chunks of wood. So I'm happy to have removed that. This is the tailings or basically the stuff left over after sifting it. And I'd say it's a at least healthy balance of wood to dirt as healthy as it can be. And then over here, this is the stuff that I was just trying to dig out and sift. And unfortunately the grain size is too small on the wood and it's just so mixed in there, I can't really properly sift this out. So like I said, I think I'm going to opt to remove some of the surface layer and just move it somewhere else because this is basically 70% wood to 30% soil. And I don't think that's going to be the best environment for growing native plants. After giving it some more thought, I decided that the best move is actually to remove this. It's just too woody. It's gonna lock out all the nitrogen and it's gonna to be too soggy for these plants to really thrive. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these top six inches. It was 100% the right call to scoop away all this material because as I was digging in there, there were certain pockets of that soil that were almost 100% wood shavings or at least 90%. And that would have been a really bad time for these native plants. So native plants like well-drained soil, they're a little rockier. If you think about where California native plants tend to live, they tend to live on hillside slopes like chaparrales, where it's really a fast draining, organic matter poor soil. So something like this is probably the worst possible scenario for a California native plant, at least the ones that I got for this area. So instead, what I'm going to do is actually set this aside and use it as a top dressing mulch once this is all planted out. As you could probably tell, it's starting to get a little bit dark and I won't have time to finish this entire plant out today, but it is actually going to be raining today. So we're gonna use that to our advantage by spreading out all this topsoil right now. And the deal is, is that the rain will help settle this topsoil into the bed and help really get it hydrated and sort of properly mixed into the sublayer. If I were to just pour all this in and plant right into it, there's a good chance it would settle a little bit and most plants don't like to be in settling soil. So this might work out to our advantage in the long run. Now, what is topsoil? Well, <laughs> that's kind of a 
loose definition or loose question, but it is essentially actually dirt. And by dirt, I mean that it's made out of minerals, things like sand, silt, clays. There's actually a little bit of rock in here and very, very, very fine small pieces of wood. This is typically what you would find sitting on the subsurface of an area where nothing's really been growing. It's just essentially soil or dirt. So this is pretty close to mimicking what a nat native plant here in San Diego or California would expect to find. And I think it's going to work out quite well. Now, the thing is with native soil, that's actually a plus for us is that it has very little actual nutrients in the terms of NPK. Now, of course, it is a mineral-based soil, meaning that it's filled with rocks and things like that. And over time, those will break down to provide some sort of mineral element nutrients, but you're not gonna get any nitrogen out of it. And that's totally fine, because most of these plants are not used to getting fertilized, they're not used to getting compost applied. They just live in native soils and Whatever they could get is what they could get. So they're not looking for high nutrients, which is why we're using topsoil instead of something like a raised bed mix or a potting mix. The other nice advantage is that topsoil is actually a lot cheaper than a lot of those other things. So it's actually pretty cheap to plant a native garden, even if you have to bring in a lot of soil. If you're having trouble finding topsoil in your local area, try calling around to your local kind of landscaping or quarry yards. I got this at a rock and gravel place. They tend to sell things like topsoil to fill in missing gaps that landscapers might make if they remove a plant or if they need to shore something up for like say building out a paved patio. So it's a great place to find something like topsoil if you can't find it somewhere else that's more convenient. Looks like I actually got the perfect amount of soil here. This should cover this area very nicely. I'm starting to get very optimistic about this project, especially since I removed all that woody material, because this topsoil is exactly what I would want for my native plants. So this is looking great. I'm gonna finish spreading it out. So that's all eight bags in, and I think that was the perfect amount for this height, because I also have that wheelbarrow full of that mulchy material that I dug out. It's going to be used as the top sort of mulch or compost layer for this planted bed. So we're gonna let this get rained on overnight, and next time I see you, we'll go over exactly what the plants are that I got, how to care for them, and how I'm going to arrange them in this area. Here's a look at the material I removed from this hole. It's very witty and very kind of clay rich. Now for comparison, here's the topsoil that I've added in. It's a lot looser, fine grained, and it's definitely going to be better at draining out any excess water. It is now day two of the native plant garden build and the rains have come and mostly passed. We might get a little sprinkles of showers throughout the day, but it looks like I have a free moment here to actually plant. And I have to say, I'm pretty happy with this topsoil. It has a nice mixture of rocks, good grain distribution. So it's allowing water to flow through while retaining a little bit of water due to the amount of clay and sort of silt that it has, which I think is just enough for these plants to be quite happy. So this is well watered and we're gonna get more passing rains, which will be perfect for establishing this garden. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time laying these plants out exactly where I want them based on their water needs, their sunlight needs, how big they're gonna get, what sort of textual contrast they'll offer. And after that, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about each one of these plants and their actual needs and why I put them where I put them. So now all the plants are laid out and the only thing left to do is plant them. So the first one up here is a sunshine monkey flower. This is an interesting one. It's actually a hybrid of a monkey flower. So it's semi-native in the sense that it's not the true native monkey flower, but monkey flowers are native to essentially all of coastal California. So I am in coastal California, so this is actually quite ideal. It's a vigorous grower, compact. It can get up to five feet wide if you don't prune it. It has these big yellow flowers that bloom all throughout summer, I believe. This next one is native to the Channel Island, so it does well in any part of coastal California, essentially. It's called the Island Alum Root. And this is a cool one because it doesn't require much water. It does well in full sun. And it actually makes these like two foot tall flower structures that have these big pink flowers that hummingbirds, butterflies absolutely love. So this should do really well up front here where I just won't water it as much and it'll be right up against the rocks. It'll be nice and hot. So I actually have two of this next plant, which is the purple needle grass. This is a really cool one because it's actually the state grass of California. And it's been actually noted to have a root system that could go up to 20 feet deep, which means it's very, very highly drought tolerant. And it only needs really water once a month in the summertime. Most of these plants that I'm planting together will only need about water once a month in the summer, at most twice a month. Next one up is one that you might be familiar with, which is Aquila, aka Yarrow. And this one is called Terracotta. Yarrow is sort of a native to all of California, it does really well in a wide range of environments. They're extremely drought tolerant 
And the deal is that basically they'll always survive, <laughs> but they will flower a lot more if you give them more water. So they're very easy to care for. And that's why it's gonna do great up here, up in the front, because it'll get plenty of sunlight. And I could choose to water it a little extra if I want it to flower more, or I could just let it produce foliage and look kind of nice as a dormant plant. As I'm digging here, I'm running into some of the roots that weren't entirely ground out. I'm not too worried because the plants will be able to navigate around those roots, but I might adjust some of these planting sites if I run into like a big piece of stump. This one is much like the other one. It's a monkey flower hybrid, and this one is actually called Fiesta Marigold. And to me, it looks a lot like those French marigolds that a lot of people grow in their gardens. So it should add a nice splash of color to this garden because it's probably gonna have the most kind of complex coloration of any of the flowers. Most native flowers in my experience tend to be sort of monochromatic. Either they're like very yellow or very pink, whereas this one has a nice little pop of contrast with the little frills of orange and yellow. So I think that's gonna look absolutely wonderful and does well in full sun or part shade. So I think this little corner bracket's gonna be great. It's a little bit compact, so it shouldn't spread too much and take over. These two plants here are called San Miguel Savory, also known as San Diego Yerba Buena. So it's actually a very native plant to our region, and it's a relative of the mint family. You could tell because it has these square stems. And when you actually rub on the leaves and give it a whiff, it has this like wonderful minty slash sage aroma that I'm really compelled by. So this is a creeper and spreader, but I should mention that actually a lot of these spread through rhizomatic growth and they can creep and be <laughs> invasive, even though they're native plants. So in this case, it's really nice that it's in this planted bed because there's nowhere for it to really run to. But if it did, I wouldn't really be too mad because it is a native plant and it deserves to be a little bit invasive sometimes. One thing I'll note is on this plant is that it requires a little bit more water than the other plants. So we're putting it towards this corner here because this corner tends to get the shade first, but we didn't want it to bury it in the back because we want to be able to come by, rub the leaves and get some of that wonderful aroma. Here's another bunch of that purple needle grass, which will, I think, contrast the manzanita in the center quite nicely. This sage in the back looks quite dramatically different than most sage that you're used to seeing, and it's called hummingbird sage. It's actually native to the oak forests of California, and that means that it tends to do best when it has a little bit of shade, which is why I'm burying it in this back corner. The other reason why it's back here is that when it flowers, it produces these three foot tall flower stalks, which will look absolutely wonderful as they come up from the back here and give this nice pop of lilac color. And as the name suggests, hummingbirds absolutely love this, which means that butterflies do too. So along this back section here is where I'm going to put my sages. No native California garden is complete without some white sage and black sage. Now these are both very culturally important plants in California and they are very prolifically native across all of California. They tend to do very well in chaparral environments which are a lot drier and hotter and more sunny, which is why they're on this side, which is the north facing wall. So they will probably get the most sun on this side and they'll give a nice little kind of ghostly look with the white sage against this much darker, black sage. And now the black sage tends to be a little bit wider and the white sage tends to be a little bit taller. So I think together they'll form a nice little patch of sage here. It's going to be also very fragrant and also all those flowers are great for hummingbirds, butterflies, etc. you name it. So this one over here is the white sage. And I have two of the white sage and right behind me is the black sage. I also have two of those, one here, one there. I think it dried out a little bit, but it still has plenty of growth and I think it'll do just fine. So now we need to plant the centerpiece of the native garden. This is the one that got us the most excited and actually really got us really hyped to plant more native plants. This is the Austin Griffiths Manzanita. It is one of these Manzanita hybrids that does really well in the garden. It has a moderate growth rate, can be a little bit wide and also tall at the same time. And it tends to flower earlier than most Manzanita, which makes it a great source of nectar for all those birds, bugs, insects, you name it in the winter time. So it's really wonderful for that. And on top of that, it will eventually produce berries, which can be foraged by birds. So it's a really great plant all around. It'll form a nice dark maroon bark and have this nice twisted gnarly branches. It'll look absolutely wonderful once it's fully grown in. I'm hoping it'll establish quickly and really put on a lot of growth in this next year because I'm really excited to see a nice manzanita. They're one of my favorite plants by far. I think I'm going to just have to plant this a little bit high and mound soil around it because this whole section is basically where the main stump was I'm running into a lot of roots. Now these roots should be breaking down over time, which will be totally fine for this manzanita. But for the time being, I can't really dig down into them. Could go get a sawzaw and try to cut them out. Couple nice pieces. 
So that was a huge fail. I could not get rid of this stump for the life of me. But what I'm going to do to help accelerate the breakdown of the stump is actually add some of the Espoma Biotone starter to it. This is pretty deep down where no other native plant's really gonna get to for a while. And the idea behind this is that providing some sort of nitrogen to help speed up the breakdown of that stump, because what happens is when you have wood buried into your soil, it'll actually starve the nitrogen from everything around it because the bacteria is trying to take everything it can to break down that lignin, that tough woody material, and it just needs a lot of nitrogen. So by burying in some fertilizer, I'm hoping that'll help speed up the process of breakdown and kill the stump. So what we're gonna do is move this purple needle grass over and this sounding bamboo stake here has indicated that it is deep enough to go unobstructed with this manzanita. So we're gonna shift plans a little bit and I'm gonna plant some native bulbs here actually. So I'm gonna go ahead, bury this in and then move that plant around. I think since the needle grass has 20 foot deep roots, it should be able to work its way around the stump. At the very bottom of this stump area, there is actually a, a ron cavity from the old tree. So I'm not too worried about this purple needle grass getting around that because it's got such adventurous roots, shouldn't have any problem. So now let's go ahead and place this manzanita here might scoot some of these a little bit, but they're actually fine as ground cover, especially since they like a little less sun. Hope maybe the manzanita will even help them grow a little better. It's actually probably gonna do a lot better here because it's all native soil without any wood chips mixed in because the primary grinding was over in this area. So this might actually end up being a net positive that I should have accepted <laughs> much sooner on in that process of trying to kill that stump. Oh yeah, this is straight native soil. This was definitely the right move. All right, let's get this in the ground. There it is. That ended up working out all right. I might have to go get a couple more bags of fill dirt because <laughs> stomping all over this area did compact it a fair amount. And I want to make sure these guys have enough soil. Since we opened up some space in the back here, I'm going to plant these two native bulbs that I got at the same nursery I got most of these, which is the Theodore Payne Foundation up in Northeast LA. And we happened to be driving through the area and we looked it up. We looked up some cool nurseries because we're plant people. And we found this place, which was absolute gem. If you're in the LA area or if you're ever passing through, I highly recommend you go through there because they have such a wonderful selection of native plants. And they also have like a walking area where they have a lot of those plants planted. So you could see what they actually look like when they're fully mature. Really cool spot, highly recommend. So we're gonna go in with this one first, which is the Splendid Mariposa Lily. It says it's, so in the coastal area, it'll want full sun and inland, you'll probably want a little bit of part sun. Let me redo that. So we're gonna go in over here with the Splendid Mariposa Lily. It's a low water requirement, not too big of a plant, maybe two feet high at the most. I'm gonna go ahead and throw that bulb right over here. And then in this area, I'm gonna go in with the second bulb, which is the Catalina Mariposa Lily. Now the only thing left to do is to cover it back up with that mulch, which is going to be all that woody, soily material that I dug out of this area to begin with. I think that'll actually do just fine in shoring up this missing soil and also provide a little bit of mulch through that use of wood, which should be already inoculated with all sorts of soil microbes and things like that since they've been buried in the soil now for a few weeks. So let's go ahead and mulch this area up. Well, I am absolutely filthy, but I've got to say I'm really happy with how this came out. This mulched up material that was left over from stump grinding really looks fabulous on top of this bed. I think it makes it look much more native with the blended rocks, the little chunks of wood and the dirt all exposed. To me, it looks fantastic. Now, in terms of maintenance and care, I'm not gonna actually do much. I'm not gonna fertilize, I'm not going to prune, I'm not gonna deadhead, because I wanna leave as much of this intact as possible for native insects and things like that to actually live here and create a natural habitat. So the more you mess with it, the less likely you are to actually get it to function like a native landscape. So that's the plan, and that's also why it's offset from my garden. I don't really want to spend too much time in here. I want to let it go wild as much as I can. And the last thing I'll say is that if you run into a stump like I did, don't take out the pickaxe and the sawzall and try to actually get rid of it. Just change your plans. And actually, I think this is going to look even better than the original plan. So I'll put all the links in the description for all the plants that I used here so you could see what they look like when they're fully grown, what sort of requirements they have, and maybe inspire yourself to also plant a native garden. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. And I'll be sure to include this in all future tours and updates so you could see how my native garden progresses.